okay, 24 here. Uh, should I use my own audio for, for my computer? No, I think it's going to give you a uh, Yeah. So, okay. so yes. Okay. okay. Let's get started. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a huge honor to start this series and, and this uh, mm -hmm. seminar this year. Uh, and it's mm -hmm. a huge pleasure to be talking to you a little bit about this fractonic behaviors in two dimensions. Mm -hmm. So Professor Yu uh, told me that no one here was uh, uh, an expert in fractons. So I want to give like a pedagogical introduction what fractons are. And then we can, once we define what are fractons, we can go from there. Uh, both for people in the, in the Zoom and also uh, here in the audience, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Please don't let me lose you. Uh, these are my collaborators, Professor Kualdeshaman from BU, my PhD advisor. This is my master's advisor, Pedro, and this is another collaborator of ours. Right now he's a, a postdoc in the International Institute of Physics in Brazil. Okay, so just to give people some context. Uh, all this hype for fractons, both in the CMT community and high energy community, and even in computer science, I would say that it started around 2015 with this paper from Vijay, Ha, and Fu, uh, which was the paper that they finally uh, figured out that these fracton phases, they were not just special cases of glasses. They were actually a new phase of them. And they gave this name, mm -hmm. fractons, because one of the main properties of this kind of systems is that the particles, they cannot move. Or if they can move, they can move only in restricted ways. For example, they can only move along a plane or a line or cannot move at all. And since they behave as fractions of mobile particles, they dub these particles fractals. A lot of people get confused what fractals has to do with fractals. Uh, but I would say to not make this connection, otherwise everything will be confusing. But there is yes, some, some connection in, in some models with, uh, with fractals. In particular, uh, before in 2000, 2015, we already had in the literature some examples of, of fractals, but we didn't know yet that these were fractals because we didn't have the name. Uh, in 2005, we had this paper. I would say that was one of the first uh, spin models for gapped fractals that we have in the literature. It was proposed by my advisor, Claudio. And later it was studied by uh, Bravi, Terhal, and Limhus. And people often call this model the Shaman code or the CBLT code. And in 2011, we also have in the literature this example where uh, Ha found this code that there are no string uh, logical operators. Uh, yes, so you see, People were studying these models because of very different reasons. So here, uh, Claudio was interested in this quantum glassness in, clear, uh, in clean materials that you don't have disorder. And you had this topological protection. And Ha was studying this model because he, he was looking for a, a, a finite temperature quantum memory. Like, can you make some phase robust enough so you can store quantum information in finite temperature and you you just don't miss, uh, the system doesn't decohere and your information can stay there. Uh, so is the, what is the, why, what is the thing that was done in 2015 that wasn't accomplished in 2011? Oh, so in 2015, uh, they had this schematic way of finding this, this fracton systems. So I, right now I'm going to tell you what, uh, what are the defining characteristics of fractons. And in 2015, they found that they defined that pro uh, models with these properties, they are fractons. For example, here in 2005, uh, Claudio just called this system uh, quantum glass. But it's very different from a quantum glass because you don't have disorder and you have this topological world protection thing. So the classification was issued in 2015? Yes, 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 yes. And then when in 2015, when people said, okay, this is a thing, this is a thing that can be interesting because of the following properties that I'm going to mention uh, later, then people started to, to study uh, this, this kind of systems. Well, okay, so as I mentioned, 
these uh, fractal systems, they have these restricted mobility quasiparticles, but it's not their only properties. They have some extra properties. Uh, and special, they are topologically ordered, at least the gapped examples that we know, uh, which means long range entanglement. If you have an, a Hamiltonian, you find the ground state or the low energy uh, states, you compute the entanglement entropy with a bipartition. This is this has long range entanglement. You can tell that this is uh, hugely entangled with each other. So it's not a trivial phase in the sense of, it's not a classical phase, it's a quantum phase. And in the spectrum, you often see these quasi particles that we call them subdimensional particles because they can only move into uh, sub lattices in our, in our system. So the examples that we know, they are three dimensional examples. So you have, for example, a cubic model and then in the spectrum, you see these particles that can only move along the lines. We call them linions. And particles that can move only along planes. We call them, with not a lot of creativity, planets. And this corresponds to one and two dimensional uh, uh, quasi-particles. Here, I'm always using uh, the names quasi-particles or par particles or excitations as the same thing. For me, there are no difference among them. And a zero-dimensional particle is a particle that cannot hop at all. This is what we call a fractal. So they have this uh, kind of fractional mobility. So they arise in these very strongly correlated systems uh, where not only the charge and the spin and the statistics can be fractional, but also their mobility. So they are kind of special. Uh, people saw that some of these properties, or in some cases, all of them, they can be recovered from these exotic symmetries or unusual conservation laws. In the high energy community and also in condensed matter, uh, people right now, right now studying these generalized symmetries where you can just apply everything we know about symmetries, spontaneous symmetry breaking and SPTs, but with some higher notions, with some gener generic notions of symmetries. And these fractal systems, uh, they provide some platforms for studying this kind of thing. As an example, the subsystem symmetries, uh, they are different from regular symmetries because you have an extensive number of symmetries. So instead of having like a, a global charge conservation in your system, you can have a charge conservation only along planes or along lines. And this is what people call subsystem symmetry. And another exotic symmetry that was not uh, a lot of studied before, I would say, are these, instead of just requiring charge conservation in our system, you also require like this higher multipole momentum conservation, like dipole or quadrupole. And we have a very nice uh, picture that we can understand what is the, what this has related to fractals. And a final characteristic that we always see in these fractal systems is this UVIR mixing of scales. This is a huge thing. This has like huge implications. In special, the way that we see this in the fractal systems is through the ground state degeneracy. So if I give a Hamiltonian, you can diagonalize it if you're good enough or if you have a good computer. Uh, and then there is nothing more low energy than the ground state, right? And the properties of the ground state. And we should believe that the properties in the IR in the low energy sector should not depend on the UV properties of your model or your UV details, for example, the lattice details. This is the basis, one of the main philosophies of the renormalization group that Kenneth Wilson taught us. But here in these models, we see that the ground state degeneracy, it depends on the system size. And it's very often it's chaos with two to the power of the system size. So if you have a system, I don't know, a cube of size L by L by L, and the, the, the number, the L is, I don't know, 1000, it's a huge system. This is a completely different uh, low energy physics than the one with 1001 layers. If you just add one layer, you change the low energy physics, which is kind of weird because it makes us, us think, can we even describe this with uh, effective field theory descriptions or stuff like that? And I'm going to expand a little bit on this later. Does this degeneracy have to be exact? Is it requiring that it's also generous? Uh, no, actually in the systems, uh, the well, the degeneracy in this topologically protected systems, they are always very robust to arbitrary perturbation. So, so I, sorry, I guess I'm a little confused what you mean by that these systems are gapped. Which definition are gapped? 
gap is just, is just like uh, you don't have gapless excitations. So you you diagonalize your Hamiltonian. The low energy, uh, the lowest energy is the ground state. You have some degeneracy here, and the first excited state, uh, even in the thermodynamic limit, the gap doesn't close. Sure, but I guess what I'm asking is uh, for this ground state degeneracy, right? Um, does it have to be an exact ground state degeneracy where all of them have to be exactly the same energy? Because if even there's a small separation in scales there, then I'm justified in calling one of those things the first excited state. If it's I see. Well, slightly higher in energy. Uh, I would say that it's, it's exact, okay. at least in the examples that are going to see that we know they're exact. Is, is, how restrictive are the conditions? Uh, an exact degeneracy. I would say that take the thermodynamic limit and take this state that is slightly above the ground state. Can you tell anything about excitations in this excited state? If you can, then I would say that this is not a ground state. Uh, very broadly, like we don't have a lot of classifications in this fractons because everything is too recent, but we have these very broad classifications of type one and type two. So type one, uh, type one fractal systems, they happen when single particles, they cannot move by themselves. So single particles, isolated particles, they are fractals. But if you gather like a bound state, like a dipole configuration, then this can, can move. They are very, uh, there are a lot of examples of fractal of type one in the literature. And now we can see why the dipole conservation can play a role here. If you try to move one single charge, you are changing the total dipole moment of your, of your state. And this is not allowed by this unusual conservation law. But now if you try to move a dipole, then you are uh, respecting all the conservation laws and everything is good. A more exotic type, however, is the type two fractals where there are no string operators. Like here, we say, oh, okay, there is no string operator able to move a single part, a single fracton, but there is a string operator that is able to move this dipole. But in type two, no particles are moved at all, not even uh, isolated particles or bound states or bound states of bound states. And examples of these kind of type two fractons are more rare. We know a couple of them, for example, the HAL code from 2011, that is an example of a type two uh, fractal system. Well, okay, so why are these interesting, right? Why, why the condensed matter theory community is making up new phases just to study their properties that will never be realized in a lab? Well, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of- Can I ask a question? Sorry, um, I'm not sure. Can you hear me? This is Vadim Ogunesi. Yes, yes, Vadim, we can hear you. Um, I'm not sure if you're planning to describe more uh, about sort of uh, mobilities of these type one and type two exit, uh, not exit, sorry, fractons. Um, what about uh, mm, somehow a few body configuration or many body configurations? So, for example, you showed that uh, type one fractons can bind up into a dipole and dipole moves, but what about type two fractons? Are you making so is it known generally that if I consider many body states of type two, of, of a system that has a type two um, quasi particle, like is a two particle state also uh, 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 not mobile or is, is it? Yeah, uh, in this type of is it fully localized? I, I guess I guess I don't know enough. I'm, I don't work in this field, so I don't really. Um, you know, if you're going to talk about it, then I'm happy to wait. But if you're not, I'm just curious as a yes or no answer. Do you? Oh, no, I'm not talking about type two fractons anymore. Uh, but no, in type two, even in, in many body configurations, you cannot move them. Uh, mm -hmm. In the example that we have, for example, in the hot code, we, there are no string operators. So if you have, for example, a configuration of many uh, excitations here in this region, you cannot mm -hmm. move them at all. The best that you can do, at least in the hot code, that it's the well-known example that we know, you can spread particles apart in some species of a fractal membrane uh, separation. So you create this Sierpinski triangles in three dimensions, right. and you can create excitations at the corners of this uh, tetahedron thing. 
Mm -hmm. right, and right, the best right. that you can do is to separate them apart, like composing these smaller uh, Sierpinsk triangles to make a, a, a higher uh, figure. And this is the connection that fractons has to do with fractals, because in this particular right. model, you have this fractal membrane, it's able to move uh, excitations apart. Thank you. All right. Uh, so these fractal systems, although we cannot still, we cannot realize them in the lab, it can take us some years. We can already learn a lot in, in theoretical physics just studying them. We see often in our quantum mechanics or QFT course that because of the representations of the braiding group in three dimensions being trivial, we can only have bosons and fermions. And we learned that we can only have anions, which are particles that can have arbitrary statistics, only in two dimensions. Like anions are something that are between bosons and fermions. The, uh, their statistics is not zero or pi. And here, if we have a type one fracton system, and we have these excitations that can only move along planes, effectively, this is a two-dimensional system, and we can have fractals. We can have, sorry, we can have annuals. So this is a physical example, uh, what kind of new physics emerge in, in these fractal systems. There are also some concrete platforms for studying these generalized symmetries, a subsystem symmetry and more gener uh, generic form of symmetries. And as I mentioned before, these UVIR mixing, they pose some challenges to us. Like they make us think how much we should know about the low, uh, about the high energy physics to be able to do, uh, to be able to, to perform physics and write down an effective description. Like we can write down hydrodynamics and how fluids uh, move and Stokes equation, Navier-Stokes equation without knowing about atomic physics. If we always had UVIR mixing, this would not be the case. We should know exactly what the atoms are doing to be able to describe a, a, an effective field theory. Okay, these are some exotic physics that we have as motivations to study these uh, fractal systems, but they are also very useful in the computer science community as, as they are a good attempt for realizing finite temperature quantum memories. Since particles, usually in these quantum memories, we want to store our quantum information in the ground state. So in the ground state, we have these uh, several degenerate uh, states in the ground state space. And we want to start information there because in these topological materials, the only way that you can go from one ground state to the other, like applying a unitary gate, is by hopping particles around. But now if, we, if it's very difficult to hop them around, uh, then you have some hope that you can realize a finite temperature quantum memory. And more interesting, since the degeneracy in these states, they grow with the power of L, roughly, this is uh, the number of logical qubits that we can realize, which is way better than what happens, for example, in the usual uh, Kitai abstract code. You have thousands of physical qubits, but you can only realize two logical qubits because the ground state degeneracy is two to the two. But here it grows with two to the L. So, okay, so in this three dimension, so in this three dimensional systems, uh, we often see this, the log of the ground state degeneracy growing with L. And then it makes us wonder, how good can we do? Can we do like a L to the power of two or L to the power of three for these gap systems? And then motivated by this, Ha, uh, two years ago, he proved this theorem assuming very mild assumptions that the best that you can do in these spatial dimensions is grow the ground state degeneracy like this, with this power. These constants here, they are things that depend only on your uh, density of degrees of freedom and the topology of your system. But if you want to grow the ground state degeneracy, the best you can do is this. So immediately, this makes us to wonder, what happens to d equals two here? Why do we have this d minus two? Can I not have a UVIR mixing in D equals two? Or can I not have fractons in D equals two? And this is one of the things that I want to tell you today. Is this related to this, uh, these no-go theorems out of the for topological order and the presence of fractal noise out of the IBM? I would say so, yes, yes. Is that the Zhu O'Connor? Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, I don't know if they are the same thing, but they are definitely related. Uh, because uh, beyond this uh, paper from Ha, there are also several other papers that I mentioned, one here, but there are many more, that they corroborate, uh, corroborate the non-existence of fractons in two dimensions. 
the intuitive idea is that you would need an extensive number of conserved quantities in two dimensions, but you don't have enough dimensions to have that. And so we, we couldn't have, for example, this, this log of ground state degeneracy growing with that. Yeah, the reason why I ask is because uh, in the context of uh, in the context of philosophy, right? Sure that you can assume properties of holographic characterizing even in the context of fractal lines. Okay. The intuitive picture to understand here is that the gravitational uh, the immersion gravity theory acts as an extra dimension that gives you the additional degrees of freedom. Your holographic quality? Right. Well, I don't I know anything about gravi gravity, but I know that high energy people, people from quantum gravity, they were actually studying this uh, fracton systems because you can write down some effective field theory, a gapless uh, effective field theory in 3D <laughs> that presents some gravitational uh, properties. Like you have this universal attracting force and some more uh, connections to gravity. But I don't know how far people went in this holographic dualities in this rectonic systems. Excuse uh, me, can I ask a quick question? Yes. So can you give an intuition why this ground cell degeneracy, how this is connected to the non-mobility of excitations? I mean, because it seems to like it seems a bit like two unrelated concepts. Uh, the non-abelian with what? Sorry. No, no. Basically, you say okay, a fractonic phase is something with excitations that are have restricted mobility. Right. And here you basically say okay, you don't have that because you don't have the ground state degeneracy. So how does the non-existence of immobile like, excitations follow from that? Oh right. Uh, so are you familiar familiarized with the with the usual Z two Tori code that Kitaya proposed? Yes. So there, like you have this string operators, right? That allows you to hop uh, from one ground, one ground state to the other. So basically you create a pair of anions of these quasi particles. You move them around the system with periodic boundary conditions. You annihilate them again, and the result is another ground state. Yes. And there, these strings, they're completely deformable, right? You can deform them a little bit in the book of the system, and you again get the same uh, ground state. That's where the topological aspects come from. But here in these fractons, when you have a string in a particular line, you cannot deform this string. This string is rigid. So mm -hmm. if you decide to go, for example, uh, in this line and not the above line, you, uh, you end up getting a different ground state. Okay, and so in two dimensions, uh, it appears to be very hard to do this. Like it's very easy to write down a classical model that obeys this kind of thing. Like if you consider uh, a plaquette model where the degrees of freedom sit on the vertices and you just apply sigma z, sigma z, sigma z, sigma z, you can show that this obeys this. But then you don't have this topological protection. So th that's the intuition. I see. Okay, thank you. So we have all these uh, things pointing for d equals two. Uh, then we ask ourselves, what, what remains if we project the three-dimensional physics of fractons in 2D? Do we get anything interesting? Do we get fractons or quasi-fractons or something? Uh, I see this. What other is this? Is there a question? Oh, do, do, no, that's ah. the beginning when you were. Oh, OK. OK, okay. okay perfect. So as a warm up, before going into this, uh, so this model that I want to present to you, let's talk about a simpler model that is well known from the literature. It was proposed by Xiao Gang Wen in 2003, and it's known as one plaquette model. Uh, it will be very useful because a lot of things that you're going to see here, you're going to repeat again in this two-dimensional model that I want to present to you. Uh, so the first thing is that this one plaquette model, it is defined in terms of the Zn degrees of freedom. So you imagine that instead of spin two, spin one half in every site, and you have a, a Hilbert space, a local Hilbert space with dimension two, you have this local Hilbert space with dimension n. And we think of operators acting on this Hilbert space as coming from this generalized Zn Pauli algebra, where now we have these unitary operators, x and z, which are the generalization of the sigma Paulis. And when they try to anti-commute, they do not just pick up a minus sign as the 
n equals two here case. It becomes this, this phase, which are roughly the, the roots of the unitary circle. They obey all of these operators. They obey this, uh, this condition to the power of n there. They go back to identity. And they are not Hermitians anymore. They are unitary, so they obey this kind of property. And now that we know these operators, x and, and z, which are known as uh, clock and shift operators, because you can think that z measures what time it is, and where every uh, dot here is a state. And x, it shifts the, the time. It shifts to another state. So now that we know these operators, we can define the Wemplaket model. The Wemplaket model is just a sum on every site of your lattice, every site i, of this plaquette term fi. And this fi is simple like this. It's just x, z, x dagger, z dagger. x, z, x dagger, z dagger. And you have this for every plaquette in your lattice, for the black plaquettes and the white plaquettes. OK, so why is this interesting? First of all, it's inter interesting because we can, it's exactly solvable. All these terms here, they commute in different sites. So you can solve everything uh, exactly. You don't need quantum Monte Carlo or perturbation theory. And it's even more interesting because you get some, some of these exotic uh, topologically ordered physics. And then maybe it will be clear what I mean by topological order. Okay, so since all the, the plaquette operators, they commute, we can find an eigenbasis that is able to diagonalize all of them simultaneously. So instead of, uh, of being concerned with the operators, all we have to do is just to be concerned with the eigenvalues. And then we can label all these states in the Hilbert space with these eigenvalues. Because of this minus sign here in the Hamiltonian, we want, if you want to describe the ground state space, we want just up the plus here in this FI. That is, we want all the, the local uh, uh, plaquette to be kind of here in the zero hour in our clock. So this defines the ground state, right? It's just the states that have fi equals one for all the sites. But now in a periodic boundary conditions, not all these fi's, they are independent. We have some constraints on them. And you can see this coming from the structure of the plaquette operators. You see, every time that I have an x here, in the diagonal, I have an x dagger. So if I take this plaquette and consider the second plaquette here and multiply them together, in every site, all the contributions there are going to cancel. So this happens here along this diagonal, and this happens here along this diagonal. And in particular, in every black plaquette, if you multiply them, they multiply to identity. And the same thing happens for the white plaquette. So it's important to have periodic boundary conditions because then when you close the system, uh, they, they cancel the end of the system. So in a square lattice, L by L, if L is even, we can have the separation of black and white plaquettes. But if L is odd, we don't have such a separation. So here we have two constraints, while here we have just one constraint. And this reflects in the ground state degeneracy, which already give us a hint of a UVIR mixing here in this very simple system. Uh, we can make this, this counting, it's very simple. We know that the Hilbert space dimension is just n, which is the local Hilbert space dimension, to the power of the number of sites that we have. And if we want to label them with these plaquette eigenvalues, uh, we have to take into consideration the constraints. And we have one-to-one -one correspondence with the sites, but then we have to subtract how many constraints we have. So these give us the ground state degeneracy. In particular, every, every state in our Hilbert space sector, they have this degeneracy. <laughs> so for L even, the ground state degeneracy is equal n to n square. And for L odd, the ground state degeneracy is just equal to L. Even more interesting than that, where, which are, I think, where the topological properties uh, become cl crystal clear, is if we study the, oh, so sorry. One very important thing about this topological order. So we have this degeneracy in the ground state. And why do we call this a topological ground state degeneracy? We call them like this because you cannot define at all any kind of local uh, operator here, some kind of uh, local per, uh, order parameter that is able to tell you the difference between ground states. 
locally they are indistinguishable. If I just give you the local properties, you cannot tell which ground state you are. For this, you would need these extended string uh, operators. And if we study the high, uh, the excited state sectors, you can convince yourself that the system is gapped. And because of those constraints, let's focus on the L even case for now. Because of the, those constraints, every time that you flip one of the plaquettes, somewhere else in the same sublattice, you have to flip another one. Otherwise, the constraint is not obeyed. And this is intrinsically related to the fact that these particles, they are always created in pairs at the endpoints of these strings. And you can move these strings around as you wish. Uh, and these strings, they are related to, to the blue and the red strings. So the blue and the red strings, they do not commute. They correspond to different excitations. Here I call them M and E excitations. And you can see that these kind of strings, they do not commute, and they give these mutual statistics for the excitations. If you keep it fixed, this blue excitation here, and you just hop this red one around and go back to the same point, you pick up a phase, which is something very non-trivial. Like if you are used to fermions and bosons, if you take two different species of fermions and bosons, you'll never pick up a phase. So this is like a generalized concept of, of self-statistics that we call mutual statistics. And these are NS. So just for the people who are uh, familiarized with uh, uh, quantum field theory, the low energy sector of this theory is, uh, is given by this double churn times thing. So in this double churn times, you can extract the ground state degeneracy, you can extract the mutual statistics, you can extract everything that is universal. You cannot extract the gap, but the gap is not universal. Okay, so this was warm up. This is a top, an example of topological order. We have all these weird things emerging, this anion, which are these known local excitations associated with strings. Uh, but now I want to go to the, to the point that I wanted to talk to you, which are these uh, two-dimensional analogous of fractals. I'll be calling the systems, so I spoil, yes. So um, a few slides back, we were talking about um, A and B notation. Can you remind us what these were? Oh, here, you mean? Yeah. Oh, so I'm so sorry. So these A and B, they are just sublattices. So A is like the white plaquettes, and B is the black plaquettes. Yeah, and so here, um, you use Z as well twice. So ZN means like integer modulo N, and then later, is that correct? So Z, you can think of Z as like a N by N matrix that acts on these local Hilbert spaces. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So if you have a spin half system sitting here in this site, you can talk like, right, sigma x or sigma z is applying in this, uh, in this operator, and I can write down a Hamiltonian for that. This is just the zn generalization of these operators. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we ask ourselves, uh, what happens if we project a three-dimensional fracton systems that we were talking before uh, into two dimensions? Sorry. These F operators, these packet operators, and these B operators that I'm going to present here are projectors, uh, local projectors, or, or, or not? You can make projectors out of them, yes. They, by themselves, they're not projectors. They're, but they're if, not projectors themselves. All right. But if you consider like sums of different powers of PNs, they would be projectors. Because you, you can. You know, postulate, for instance, uh, I'm trying that project, um, you know, spin two on the bucket, for instance, you know, the subspace with spin two on each bucket. And then you have what's called a frustration free Hamiltonian that has massive degeneracy also, like uh, an extensive degeneracy. But it's not necessarily topological, I think. Uh, yeah, I would say that's not topological in this case. Right. But you can you can think of all these systems as a uh, sum of commuting projectors. <clears throat> you can just write down the Hamiltonian to be sum of commuting projectors. But that's frustration-free Hamiltonian. So these are all frustration-free Hamiltonians in that sense. Yeah, the problem is for that plaquet, it is more like subsystem symmetry breaking. And you do have sub-extensive number of ground state degeneracy, but you can lift degeneracy by some local operator, like just a spin operator or a spin by linear right. operator. And what happened here is for a lot of fracton code, it's degenerate, and in a thermodynamic limit, even you add on whatever local operators, it would not leave degeneracy, or it would only leave the degeneracy up to some, some small gap that exponentially decay with the system size. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is why they call it 
logical in the sense that it's robust to local populations. Mm -hmm. All right. That's thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. So now you can ask yourself, okay, we have this topological order. Everything here in the Van Plaquette model, if you fix L to be even, everything is topological. Uh, and that's why the effective field theory is a topological quantum field theory. You can smoothly deform the lattice and the underlying manifold here, and nothing will change. But here in these fracton systems, we saw that not only topology is important, but also geometry. <clears throat> here, topological order doesn't care about geometry. And now we can ask ourselves, can we have something that resembles geometry, that have the UVR mixing that we saw before? So for this, let's try this very, very naive idea. Oh, first, let me just give you the answer. Can we have gapped fractons in 2D? The answer is no. But we can still have something that resembles fractons. And we call those like quasi-fractons or effective fractons. And this name here, quasi-fractons, we first heard from Saul and uh, Xiao Gang Wen. Uh, but then let's try this very naive idea. Let's take a three-dimensional fractal system. For example, <laughs> the CBLT model, the Shaman code. It is just written like this. It's defined on a FCC lattice. So for every center of a cube, you can just apply it. sigma x, sigma x, sigma z, sigma z, sigma y, sigma y on the six neighbors in the center of this cube. So it's a complicated lattice. Let's not bother about that. But this is the interaction that we put in the Hamiltonian. So let's try to project it down to 2D by doing this. Let's just think, a very naive idea. Let's just think of this third dimension as being squeezed down to a plane. Oh, down to a plane. Uh, so we think that this 3D actually lives just in a single layer in this two-dimensional system. So now we have this generalized plaquette, which is not just a four-body interaction, but it's a five-body interaction. So it's just written here. So it's a sigma x, sigma x, sigma z, sigma z. And this operator here in the center, it remembers the sigma y. But now, because I'm talking about the Zn Pauli operators, sigma y square is not the identity anymore. So what I do is just writing sigma y equals to x dagger square and z dagger square. So this is a very naive model. It's a two-dimensional model defined on a square plaquette uh, system. What can it give us? First, it is still exactly solvable, which is kind of a, a miracle, right? So we can solve and find everything. It is topologically ordered, which is something that we got uh, for free. We didn't know in the beginning that it would be topologically ordered. So this kind of property survived from the three-dimensional system. And what else can we have? If we try now to, to estimate what is the degeneracy of the ground state, we can again play the same game that we did for the when plaquette model and find what are the constraints in the plaquette operators. Before I was calling those Fs, but now I'm calling those Ps. And here we have these more exotic uh, identities. So we again, if we multiply all the plaquettes in every site, we get the identity, just like we had before. But now we have this non-uniform uh, constraints here that we, on every site that we apply, x is just the, the x hat along the horizontal direction and y hat along the vertical direction. We just put this weight here, this weight x. And the same here, the same thing here for y and the same thing for the product. These uh, weights here, rho, they appear because as we go over the system, we have an lx uh, size system in the horizontal direction. As we increase the weight, so here I multiply b to the zero power, b to the first power, b to the second power, blah, blah, blah. But then when we get to the nth power, we have this property because we are talking about the Zn operators. And now it's like I, I started back from the beginning. So now I have this commensurability of how many of these strings can I fit in Lx? That's why that's where these factors come from. Uh, they are just the order of the group divided by the GCD where GCD stands for the greatest common divisor. So now all these things that appear in, in number theory, they start to appear here exactly because of this commensurability effect when we have these periodic boundary conditions. If we think of these uh, constraints as conservation laws, we can think of these as dipole conservations. And this is the uh, off-diagonal component of the quadrupole moment. So we can think of this as a system that 
conserves not only charge, but also dipole and quadrupole. So okay. maybe there is still hope that we can get some fractonic physics here, yeah. and we do. From those constraints, we can show that the ground state degeneracy has this very weird looking expression where it depends sensi uh, with a lot of sensitivity on the details of the lattice. All these ground states, so we have several of them, a lot of them, uh, they are locally indistinguishable. So they are still topological. There is no order parameter that you can define. There is no local perturbation that you can add to the Hamiltonian to lift this degeneracy. Uh, you, we still get the UVIR mixing. So this uh, also survived our very naive projection down to two dimensions. But now the difference is that we are not violating uh, Haas theorem. Remember, Haas theorem told us that in two dimensions, the ground state degeneracy cannot scale with L. Even though we have L uh, appearing here, we have this property of the GCD. The GCD, the greatest common divisor between any two numbers, they are always bounded by the numbers. So if I have a thermodynamic limit here, L is, I don't know, of order 10 to the 23, but M is six, this is never greater than six. So we are good. We are obeying all the no go theorems. Oh. Sorry, can I say that again? Isn't this dramatically <coughs> reduce the efficiency of this as a quantum memory? Because now your actual ground state degeneracy is quite small compared to. Uh, this would be uh, this would be something in between, like the the good case, which is a fracton, and the the not so good case where you can just realize, for example, the minimum, the, the, the lower bound for the ground state. We can realize a little bit, not too much. So this for a quantum memory is not interesting at all because you need a lot of physical qubits to just realize, I don't know, 10 logical qubits. So it's not advantageous. Okay, what else survives to our naive projection? The cool thing uh, is that the Linions and the fractons, in some extent, they also survive to the projection. You can show that if you want to study string uh, string operators in your system, because of this dipole conservation, they have to, re to be rigid. So if you consider this string, this is an excited state, you create one dipole configuration, one dipole configuration, and you can stretch your string, but you cannot bend the string. If you try to bend it, you create more and more excitations out of the vacuum, which is again, some resemblance from the three-dimensional fracton system. If you want to not consider dipoles, but only isolated particles, you can show, now I'm going to lie a little bit for you. You can show that the only way is to spread them with these uh, membrane operators. So this is a true fracton. There are no string operators that can move this but I just say that I'm lying because there is one additional operator here. Uh, it took us a while to see that. And that's the reason that I call those quasi fractals because there is actually a way to move an isolated fractal here, which is through this string operator here. We have emerging from this ZN algebra, this length N uh, string operators. They are uh, in the one plaquette model, they were also there but it turns out to be that this N there was just two. So you could just hop a particle from a white sublattice to another white sublattice, which was almost trivial, right? But here, not so trivially, we have these N size operators. They are there. So we could just go back, take this uh, isolated excitation here, apply the nth operator, and now I could just move it to there. So this is why I don't call this a fractal. If this was a fractal, this other string would not exist. But here it exists, and that's why we call this uh, a quasi fractal. Okay, uh, these strings, they actually give us a very nice picture to understand where this uh, commensurability comes from. We can only hop isolated particles of, uh, with steps of size n, and particles that cannot be reached, if I have a particle here and here, and they cannot be reached by string operators, they are not equivalent particles. They are different kinds of anions. In this paper from Sao and, and Wen, and Chao Gang Wen and Salvatore Pes, 
they, uh, they introduced this idea of position dependent anions. And you can actually show, this is also present in our model, that the anions in different positions, they have different quantum numbers. So they have different statistics, they have different charge, and this is very exotic. It's also something that survived from the three-dimensional projection. And in this, in this paper, they were studying this, uh, this model called rank two Tori code, which is, a, uh, which is a tensor generalization of the usual Kitayev Tori code. Uh, okay, why is this model still interesting in practice? We argue in our paper that these fractons, although you can still move them with these uh, length n operators, in practice, if you realize this in a lab someday with this very weird fine tuned Hamiltonian, effectively the particles cannot move. And why is that? We can try to add perturbations to the Hamiltonian. So now the system is not exactly solvable anymore and you have to do perturbation theory. But you can show that this perturbation introduces characteristic times in the system. These characteristic times, they, they make, uh, so the perturbation, the effect is to make particles to hop. And this characteristic time is roughly how long it will take for the particles to start hopping. So you can show that for the dipole, it's quite, it's quite nice actually, it's quite small. The dipole, since they can move right along this, uh, along their axis, you don't need a lot of perturbation to move this dipole. However, if you have a single excitation, not a dipole, a single quasi-fracton, it would take, in perturbation theory, of order n to the squared uh, order to be able to move that fractal. And this introduces this tau monopole here, which is huge. It grows uh, super exponentially with the order of the group. So even for conservative groups, for example, let's say n is equal to five, this is not impossible to do. And let's say that this perturbation, uh, J, uh, J is the size of the gap. Let's say that G here, which is the magnetic field, is one tenth. So this is like 10 to the power of 25. This is huge. In some units, this is larger than the age of the universe. In some units. So effectively, in practice, this behaves like fractals. So we have these effective fractonic behaviors in two dimensions, although the system is not fractonic by uh, per se. Okay. Uh, so the last words that I want to tell you is about the effective descriptions of such system. We have this UV IR mixing thing. So does it even make sense try to describe the IR physics of trying to forget the lattice? Does it even make sense to write down a continuum uh, action like this? And we argue that yes, if you take some <laughs> care on how you regularize the, the system, and also some care in which scale of time you are doing your experiment. Because of the emergence of this uh, tau monopole time, this effectively separates the description into two scales. So first, let's study the characteristic times that are very small in comparison to tau monopole. In this scale, when you see a particle sitting there, just living, uh, minding their own business, they do not move. It will take an exponential time for them to move. They just stay there. In this, uh, in this scale, you still have dipole conservation and quadrupole conservation. And we argue that this chern simons like field theory is able to recover them. If you are familiarized with chern simons field theory, you'll see one big difference here, which are the order of the derivatives. The order of the derivatives now, they're just not linear uh, as usual, but they are square. Uh, these classes of generalized chern simons like theories, they were already studied, for example, in this paper by Professor Yu and uh, also Professor Ha and his students, they also studied this dipolar BF theories that they call, which is very similar. I don't want to, to go deep in this. I just want to call your attention to two things. This is not topological anymore. These derivatives here, they make the geometry matter. So now you have to be careful with the geometry. This scale that appears here, it resembles the lattice scale. So different theories would correspond to different A's, which is somehow a manifestation of this UVIR mixing in the system. And you cannot get rid of those just 
risk colonating your fields. It's always there. Uh, and as I mentioned, these higher derivatives, they take into account this uh, dipole and charge conservation. Lastly, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about what happens when you're doing your experiment in times that are too large in comparison to tau monopole. So let's say that this tau monopole, monopole is just some microseconds and you're doing your experiment in hours. So effectively now, all the particles, they can move. This n times a, which is the size of the how of the step that the particles can move, it's effectively zero. Everyone can hop uh, all around. And even the higher multiple momenta, they are not conserved anymore because they were conserved only mod n a and mod n a square in the case of the quadrupole. And effectively now in this continuum limit, this is zero. So now this is just given by uh, the effective field description. It's just a topological field theory, just the usual chern simons K matrix description. However, there is just, this is the K matrix. There is one catch. If you want to make sure that this describes the system, you cannot just make sense of it in the continuum. You have to regularize your, your system. Otherwise you get the, the wrong properties. For example, the usual way that we compute the ground state degeneracy is just take the determinant of this K matrix. This is the ground state degeneracy for this topological quantum field theory. If we do this here, this is n to the power of four, which is not the case that we got there. You have to be careful on how you regularize your theory because now the UVIR mixing thing information is encoded in these twisted boundary conditions. As you go over the torus, the fields, they do not come back to themselves. They mix among these different flavors of I and J's here. And that's how uh, the UVIR mixing survives even in, in this description. Okay, my time is, is getting to the end. And I just want to, to mention some final remarks. Uh, please don't think that fracton physics is all about these uh, exactly solvable lattice models, because it's not. There are several approaches to them. Like you can even talk about fractons without talking about spins or even without referring to, to uh, 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 I would say a lattice, but I don't know about that. So we have the several approaches. I, I put some, uh, some references here if you want to give it a look. Uh, we saw that when you try this very naive idea of projecting down the three-dimensional physics to two dimensions, they still survive. So I don't know, this raises some questions, like can we do this for even more exotic models like the Ha code? What happens when you try to project a type two fraction down to 2D, what survives, what doesn't survive? And just a final remark, uh, all these systems, all these Hamiltonians that I presented to you, they are very fine tuned, right? If you have a system, a physical system, uh, those are not the natural interactions that you would try to write in down your Hamiltonian. The only reason that we wrote those is because they are uh, exactly solvable. So we can extract everything. So what happens if we add more and more terms? Like what are the possibility of terms that we can add to the Hamiltonian? How do we sweep in this space of theories that we have here where this is like a sensibility of lattice geometry. It's a measurement of how much UVIR mixing you can pick up. Uh, so here in the extreme left, you have the Kitaev's original Tari code where the physics is completely, uh, it ignores completely the lattice. You can define this in an arbitrary triangulation of a lattice and the physics is still the same. The one plaquette model is a little bit to the right because as we saw the one plaquette model the physics depend if you're an even by even lattice or an odd by odd, odd by odd lattice. Now, as we go here to the right, you can reach the, the extreme right. And here are the examples of fractals where they are very sensible to the, to the lattice details and even more for the half hold because you have these fractal structures or a model is somewhere here in between as uh, such as the rank two Tori code. But now we ask like, how do we navigate across this, this system? Because when we use renormaliza renormalization group, we very often just say, oh, okay, the low energy physics doesn't depend on the high energy physics. The lattice details doesn't matter. So we can just uh, do this uh, risk, uh, risk area lattice, 
do this uh, cluster, integrate it out, and get an effective description or get your beta functions, and etc. Um, yes, that's it. Uh, thanks to Sal for, I think he showed some picture like this. This gave me this idea of this nice picture. Yes, I'll be happy to get, get any, any questions that you may have. All right, thanks for the great talk. Any questions? <clears throat> so actually, I think I have a question in terms of this graph. So in terms of UBR, uh, uh, UBR mixing, we can calculate like kind of logical degeneracy or some type of uh, correlation functions and manifest in UBI mixing in equilibrium. And is there a way to manifest whether you have UBI mixing or how much UBI mixing you have out of equilibrium? Out of the equilibrium? Like in terms of form dynamics or something like that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know much about other equilibrium stuff. Uh, in the and the original paper from Claudio Schumann that he proposed that quantum uh, the CBLC model, he was actually interested in, in how the the system thermalize uh, when you put it in a finite temperature bath. But I think even there, because in the original paper he was not aware of this UVIR mixing. It was only after uh, due to Terhal and Brevet. And Brevet. But I don't know. Uh, it it could be an interesting question to try to answer. Any other questions? To what degree is the, is the change in behavior from 3D CBLT to 2D CBLT um, exactly determined by the um, types of symmetries that survive the projection? Oh, good question. In the CBLT, you can show that so here in the 2D CBLT, we had these dipole and quadrupole conservations, right? So these are just a generalization of uh, charge conservation. In the CBLT, they have a very different kind of uh, conservation, which are the following. You have this uh, cube system, and now you can think of the planes that cut the system in these cube diagonals, like one, one, one planes in this Buehler notation. For every one of these planes, you have a conserved quantity. So on every plane, you have a charge conservation there. So there you can see why you have this extensive, sub-extensive uh, ground state degeneracy due to these conservations. But here we don't, because they, they are in these uh, cube diagonals. So when you project to a plane, they roughly just go to the charge conservation because our, our two-dimensional system is roughly their plane. So we lose this information. That's what we lose in the process of projection. So hypothetically, I, I don't know if these things really exist, but if you had a higher dimensional phyton model, so like a phyton theory of four dimensions. Uh, there are, yes. And you talk about dimensional reduction to lower numbers of dimensions, and you have more flexibility in terms of how you choose to perform those dimensional reductions. Yes, you have a lot of freedom to do that. It appears, it, it seems to me then you should be able to have better control over what sort, what specific fracton-like properties survive in lower dimensions if by controlling how you do the projection. I agree, yes. I think if you are like, I want these and these and these properties to survive, if you're clever enough, I don't know, should be, I don't know, along the, uh, one X is if you do the projection, that survives. But then you have to pay the price what you lose. For mm -hmm. example, here in this case, where, where this sub-extensive number of conserved quantities, but, but then you can kind of generate an interesting phase diagram of uh, like a, an, an interesting phase diagram where the axes are how you're choosing your projection. I think so, yeah. In terms of what features you want to save. So if you're, for example, very interested in quantum memory aspects of it, as opposed to this other one, you could probably prioritize those features. I agree. Yes. Yeah. Ensure that you're not violating Haas upper bound. I, I think you're good. Yes. Perfect. Very good. Yes. My question. So could you remind us um, what the name of the model was that we, like the two A and B placket model? Uh, oh, yes. And so my question was, um, what was the defining characteristic um, that's the difference between the two placquettes? 
so this is called the <laughs> Wen plaquette model. So Xiaogang Wen, he has this paper from 2003. I think it's called, uh, it's this one, quantum order is in an exact solvable model. But in, actually in chapter 10 of his textbook, he gives a, uh, he gives a very detailed description of the, the system and the low energy physics. So the difference is just this. Uh, there is actually nothing mysterious about this uh, A and B sublattices. Imagine that I have periodic boundary conditions here. So I'm going to identify this site with this site. If this is another odd number of sites. I have uh, one, two, three, four, five, five, right? Because the next one is already the one. So here you see, I'm gluing a black plaquette with a black plaquette. So I have this ill-defined line here when I do this periodic boundary conditions. If I had one extra, the next one would be white. So now I could glue together and the periodic boundary conditions, they are completely compatible with this checkerboard. So this is where here in the one pocket model, the sub lattice structure uh, shows up. It just depends if the lattice is odd or if the lattice is even. Yeah. Yeah, so I have a question on Sun Chen. Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Oh, good. Uh, so I was wondering if, if you've studied what the generalized symmetries of your 2D model are, and if you have uh, what they are. Uh, uh, actually, I don't know. This is something okay, that is well, my yeah, to-do list, because I saw uh, your recent paper where you do this for the rank two, uh, rank two Tory code, right? With uh, the paper with Professor Yu. Uh, I didn't have the chance yet to, to do this with care because before we were not interested in these properties, uh, but I think it could be very, very insightful to, uh, and learn more about the physics of this model. Okay, but cool. As, as, yeah, as if long you, as uh, I learn, I'll let you know. Okay, yeah, please, yeah, you should like message me or something because I'm pretty curious, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the talk, by the way. It was really clear. No, oh, thank you for, for attending. Any other questions? No question, let's take this.